I'm Jeff Sikinga, Executive Director of the Ashbrook Center, and this is The American Idea, coming to you from Peter Schramm's library in Ashland, Ohio. In this podcast, we explore America's crisis in civic education. Too many people today don't understand the history and principles that make us Americans. So we're here to explore America's history and principles and what they mean for today, what we can learn from them, and how we can restore them to their rightful place in our hearts and minds. We think it's the most important thing we can do as Americans to keep our experiment in self-government alive. So thank you for joining us in this important conversation. You can learn more about Ashbrook and the work we're doing with students, teachers, and citizens at ashbrook.org. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another version of the American Idea Podcast. I'm your host, John Moser, and I am delighted to have with me today uh, a good friend and a highly respected colleague and a wonderful scholar named uh, Dr. Dan Monroe. Dan is, uh, is, is professor and chair of the Department of History at Millican University in Peoria, Illinois. Uh, he is also an executive director of the Abraham Lincoln. I should have this information in front of me. The American Lincoln, uh, sorry, the American Lincoln, the Abraham Lincoln. Uh, uh, tell me what that is. So I'm I'm the Illinois historian on the board of trustees of the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library Museum. So I, I sit on the board and in that capacity. There you go. Yeah. But Dan, Dan's also a, a, a very, uh, a very old good friend of mine. Uh, We've known each other since the 1990s when we went to graduate school together at the University of Illinois, from which we both received our PhDs. Uh, he is, uh, he's been at, at Millican ever since, uh, well, pretty much ever since he finished. Right? Is that right? I worked in state government for four years, uh, including a year as a fellow with the Lincoln legal papers. And then I did a year as a visiting professor at Bradley. All right. And then I was at Millican from 2006. And, uh, and Dan is also one of the most popular members of the faculty in our Master of Arts in American <laughs> History and Government program at Ashland University. And uh, if anyone out there is interested in that, I'm sure we would be, there were many, many people who would be happy to get information in your hands about that program. Uh, but today, we are not going to be talking about Abraham Lincoln. We're talking about another uh, research interest <laughs> of Dan's, an extremely fascinating one. And that is Ernest Hemingway, one of the uh, one of the most famous uh, authors of, of the 20th century United States. And we're going to be talking today about his life and the ways in which he is representative of what they used to call the American century. And so he's a he's an individual who was born in 1899 um, uh, and, 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 and really is is. Uh, eyewitness to some of the most important events of the 20th century. Uh, so, Dan, first of all, I want to thank you for uh, for joining us. Thank you and, for having me, and thank you for that kind introduction. Well, my pleasure. Well, let's start off with uh, uh, the very beginning. Right? He's again uh, Hemingway's born in 1899. He's brought up in Illinois, so a product of the Midwest, as you are as Abraham Lincoln was. Um, <laughs> but, it, it, you know, when I when uh, I, I saw that he was born in 1899, what immediately came to mind was a speech given by Theodore Roosevelt in that same year called The Strenuous Life. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and immediately it occurs to me that's a term that could very much be used to apply to Hemingway himself. Could you say something about the influence of, right, he's a child during the, uh, during the Theodore Roosevelt years, kind of the enduring influence that uh, uh, that the first Roosevelt had on Hemingway's development? Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up because I, I do think it's very important to note that Hemingway is born uh, just as the 19th century is ending and the 20th century is beginning, yet his childhood has all the echoes, uh, lots of echoes of the 19th century. You know, for example, his uh, grandfather fought in the Civil War and when we have the 4th of July parade at Oak Park, um, his grandfather would put on his old Union Army uniform and walk on the parade with his with the, his medals. Um, so Hemingway, you know, 
uh, has this kind of connection to the 19th century and the values in the 19th century. At the same time, as you suggest, I think quite correctly, John, I'm so glad you brought up uh, the strenuous life. You know, uh, Roosevelt gives that speech in Chicago in 1898. I think it's the year before Hemingway is born. I don't, you know, I may don't nail me uh, to the cross on that, but I think it's 1898. And, and as you suggest, in many respects, the, this kind of Rooseveltian ethos is the atmosphere that Hemingway breathes as a young man. You know, Roosevelt arguing that, well, you need to live a life that uh, to the fullest, whatever it is that you do. And, you know, Roosevelt wasn't necessarily suggesting that everybody had to be a soldier or some kind of, you know, um, you know, a, a, a naval officer or something like that. You could be a librarian, but you had to be the best librarian that you could possibly be. You know, you had to be in that library every day, uh, you know, working hard at cataloging and, and you know, your duties. And if you were a writer, you had to write. Um, you know, that's the Rooseveltian ethos that life should be lived uh, abundantly and that uh, and not pa in a passive way. You should be aggressive about whatever it is you decided to pursue. And so Hemingway, um, I think, breathes that in. And of course, the other argument that Roosevelt is making is that the United States should bestride the world stage, you know, should have should be an international power. You know, it was Roosevelt who sent the uh, the great white fleet, the, uh, the new the new battleships that the Navy had built that were made of steel uh, on a f uh, and then they painted the hulls white and sailed out of uh, Norfolk and went all around the world basically saying, uh, you know, I think there were 17 of them. All of them, you know, basically always saying, well, we're now a significant force in, in the world um, and and we, and that needs to be taken into account. And so Hemingway's life, you know, Hemingway spent most of his life overseas. You know, uh, he did not return to Oak Park and live. He, um, you know, he, he left as soon as he could um, and basically never went back uh, except for a brief stint after World War One. And uh, and so he lived. And, I, and the other thing I would say is he lived this kind of Rooseveltian ethos in his work. You know, he was very, um, he was someone who kept track, who would get up early and write, and then would keep track of how many words he'd done. You know, it was kind of a way of saying, well, you know, I worked today. I did, uh, you know, 900 words. Uh, you know, sometimes he would write them on the, on the wall um, as kind of a way of uh, reassuring himself that he was living up to that ethos. Um, so Roosevelt was very, you know, as a boy, there are pictures of him in a, as a boy with a pith helmet on, <laughs> you know, in this kind of uh, theater, Roosevelt, you know, Roosevelt, you've seen pictures of him in Africa and hunting, and he's got that kind of stereotypical garb on from that period. And Hemingway as a boy, you know, kind of imitated him. So uh, I think Roosevelt, you know, uh, y y y that kind of atmosphere couldn't help but influence Hemingway in, uh, in the way that he lived and worked. Uh, was was his own you mentioned his grandfather having been a civil war veteran was was his own father much of an influence i think very much so his father was a passionate outdoorsman ed hemingway was a doctor and had a practice out of his home uh and um eventually had uh, uh, um uh, i think he had an office outside of his home too at some point but the upshot is uh, Ed Hemingway was a passion outdoorsman and uh, introduced Hemingway to fishing and hunting at a very young age and, you know, taught him all of the essentials. You know, how do you catch a trout? How do you gut a trout? How do you cook a trout? How do you how do you shoot a squirrel? How do you um, take the fur off a squirrel? How do you prepare a squirrel? As a, you know, you know, the, the kind of basics. Um, and they had a house in uh, northern Michigan that they went to in the summer, you know, they had kind of a summer house. Um, and every summer they went there and then, and Ed would spend his time with his uh, children, kind of imbuing them with this love of the outdoors, which stayed with Hemingway all of his life. I mean, Hemingway was a very passionate outdoorsman, um, became a kind of world-class deep sea fisherman, marlin fisherman, uh, was a passionate hunter. Um, indeed, uh, many of his short stories, um, uh, are derived from his experience outdoors, uh, so that's very much a part of his life, and that came from Ed. So he, he uh, graduates from high school, 1916, 1917, um, and uh, my understanding is he works for a few months as a journalist, but then uh, the United States is, gets involved in the First World War, 
and uh, and, and and Hemingway wants to be part of this great adventure. Uh, could you tell us uh, about his World War One experiences and how they left their mark on his career? Yeah, that's uh, fabulous. Uh, yeah, he works for the Kansas City Star out of high school, gets a job there and works as a kind of cub reporter doing crime stories, which is a great way to break into journalism. You know, you go to an accident or a crime scene and um, and you write it up. Uh, and the Kansas City Star had a great style guide, you know, um, you know, telling you know, you know, how, how, how to write a story, right? You know, have a good opening paragraph, write simple declarative sentences. You know, it's, it's a, it's still to this day, a fabulous guide to good writing. So he, you know, he gets this kind of a brief apprenticeship and then he goes off to the war. Uh, you know, he tried to join the army, um, uh, but he had bad eyesight and was rejected. One of his eyes was damaged in uh, childhood. Um, so the army rejected him. So he joins the Red Cross and the Red Cross ships him over to Paris and then to Italy, where he's basically an ambulance driver. And so he's um, uh, part, but part of his duties were to um, bring chocolates and cigarettes <laughs> to troops that were in the front lines. And of course, the, as as you may know, John, because I know you're a great student and scholar of European history, there was a horrifically bitter conflict between Italy and Austria and uh, uh, Germany along the Italian Austrian border that featured all the horrors of trench warfare plus uh, mountainous terrain. So Hemingway's up there as an ambulance driver. He's delivering chocolates and cigarettes to the troops. And uh, on July the eighth, nineteen eighteen, uh, he was in a uh, while well, he was in the in the front lines. Uh, he was injured severely, injured in a mortar attack. You know the Austrians dropped mortar rounds, and Hemingway was basically blown up, and his leg was severely injured he spent six months in the hospital it looked at one point like his leg might he might lose his leg but the um surgeons who had gotten pretty good at you know um dealing with severe wounds just out of practice uh managed to save his knee and his leg uh but but for our purposes you know that was a, that that wounding and you know being in a in a hospital where everyone speaks uh, italian and you don't, <laughs> you know, and you've been wounded and you're, and he was 18 years old, you know, he's an 18 year old kid. And uh, so I think that was a very traumatic experience. Um, it shapes Hemingway's early fiction. Indeed, you can make the argument that in some respects, Hemingway's early fiction is him processing the experience of being severely wounded in, in Italy and being in the hospital for six months um and then having to cope with that uh you know i i think you could make the case that hemingway showed symptoms of a kind of mild ptsd you know post-traumatic stress syndrome uh in 1919 when he comes back to oak park he's in a hospital in italy for six months and then he basically comes back to oak park um and his early fiction is uh in large respects him drawing on that so he uh he has, uh, as as a lot of veterans did, especially those who uh, who endured serious injuries. Um, he he has trouble adjusting to the post war uh, to post war America. Uh, he doesn't stick around in Oak Park long. Uh, where does he go from there? And um, and and I, at one point, I, I'd like to to. Uh, Talk maybe about his multiple marriages. He was a he was a guy who had a hard time staying with any particular woman. I'm wondering <laughs> how that plays into things. Sure. So he 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 meets uh, he comes back to Oak Park in 1919, and he um, uh, works gets gets a job for the Toronto Star. It's kind of a stringer, you know. He's he's filing occasional pieces for him, and also for uh, uh, you know I think he's working for an obscure Chicago uh, monthly. You know, he's a writer, but he's not making much money. He meets Hadley Richardson, who uh, becomes his first wife. She's from St. Louis. She comes up to Chicago and they, they meet at a party and they get married in September of 1921. And then he uh, signed the Toronto Star, uh, makes him kind of foreign correspondent. So they go to Paris in the fall of uh, uh, 1921 and they live there until, um, or he lives there until 1927, 1928, when he moves to Key West. It's a very important period in his career. You know, he meets, uh, he, he wants to become a great fiction writer. And um, Sherwood Anderson, to his lasting credit, gives him kind of letters of introduction to people like James Joyce 
and Gertrude Stein and, you know, some of the great experimental stylists in the 1920s. So he meets these people, starts writing short fiction while he's doing journalism. I think he filed like 80 some pieces, 80, 90 pieces for the Toronto Star in this period. And he's meanwhile, he's doing his fiction uh, when he has his spare time and he's being mentored by some of the great experimental stylists of this period, you know, and what they're telling him is, um, you know, to, to write in a kind of um, spare manner, you know, kind of denude your prose of all these adjectives, you know, that you see in the 19th century, you know, the, the great Dixon's novel, you know, Dickens might spend 10 pages on the, describing a room, you know, and it's littered with adjectives and adverbs. I think it's, I think it's wonderful, but it's definitely a different style than Hemingway, you know, Hemingway's stylistic ex uh, excellence was to denude his fiction of all of these extraneous things and to kind of distill it down into this absolute, you know, like a diamond, this kind of fine prose that conveys emotion and yet is spare. And uh, he, he describes this in his, his bullfighting book, which is probably the best book ever written on bullfighting, which is kind of an obscure subject. Mm -hmm. But it's worth meeting because it has all this in, in the course of writing about bullfighting he has all these kind of comments on his writing and in the bullfighting book he he talks about the uh iceberg theory you know the idea that uh, uh when i write prose i just show a bit of the message above the water and much of it is below and is left for the reader to infer you know and a classic example of this would be um Big Two-Hearted River, which is a two-part short story about uh, a perennial Hemingway character, Nick Adams. Nick Adams, who's clearly suffered from some kind of a trauma in the story, goes to northern Michigan and engages in fishing next to a river that he had fished prior to whatever trauma, you know, trauma isn't described. Um, but he, he suffered some kind of emotional damage. So he goes to this, this you know, pristine northern Michigan river that he'd fished as a young man before his trauma. And um, it's clear, and he does things like set up his camp and catch a trout, clean a trout, eat a trout. He does these things, and as he does them, he gains confidence. So nothing, it, you, you never get, it, you know, in the story, there's never a sense of, Hemingway doesn't bluntly say, well, Nick Adams was blown up in <laughs> World War I, he was hideously wounded, and he couldn't sleep at night. Nothing, nothing like that is conveyed. Instead, he describes the process that Nick is going through to try to restore his emotional equilibrium. And there are all kinds of allusions and metaphors to it. You know, in the story, Nick comes upon grasshoppers that have been turned black because they are kind of frolicking in the soot from a big fire that had destroyed a city near the uh, small city near the uh, near the river. And Nick muses. Gia, these grasshoppers have obviously are covered with soot. I wonder if they'll ever be normal again, if they'll ever have the the the, the usual color of green or greenish brown that a grasshopper would have again. Well, you know, you can. You, it's easy to, to to sense that what Hemingway's saying is, you know, will Nick Adams ever be normal again? Will he ever recover his emotional equilibrium that he's lost as a result of this unsaid traumatic experience? Um, hmm. So that's Hemingway's stylistic, and that's the stylistic genius that he hones while he's in Paris being uh, mentored by Gertrude Stein and others. You know, a, a couple of things that come to mind as you say this. Uh, one, to, 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 to loop Theodore Roosevelt and the, Roosevelt and the uh, uh, strenuous life speech back into it, he, he talks about the over-civilized, the dangers of the over-civilized man. And so the, the, this this virtue of of getting getting back to nature and living by one's own wits, uh, surely it, that truly sounds like an echo to that. Also, I, I can't help but think when you're talking about his his spare form of writing and how it contrasts with Victorian Victorian writing styles. I, I I'm thinking about architecture, the rise of the arts and crafts movement as a reaction against. All the fancy gingerbread uh, uh, that you found on 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 Victorian homes that was that was almost unmanly. But arts and crafts, the lines are the, the lines are, are clear. Uh, it, there, there's nothing in, in in the way of of unnecessary ornamentation. I, it, it, that these two developments 
in literature and architectures go almost hand in hand with one another is fascinating. No, and I, I think that's quite right. Uh, and and um, you, you know, this is this is part of a I, I think a repudiation of what was reviewed as the uh, failed values of the nineteenth century. You know, the the World War One was a catastrophe. In fact, I think World War One. You can make the argument that World War One was the worst thing that happened in the last two centuries, which is which is a strong statement. But think of all of the colossally terrible things that have come out of World War I. And for, first of all, it was a, a disaster in terms of casualties. But uh, at any rate, it seemed to Hemingway and his generation that World War I demonstrated that the values that he had grown up with in Oak Park had proven false. You know, the idea of patriotism and honor and that you could go off to this war and earn great glory and then come back and march in the 4th of July parade like his grandfather Anson. Uh, you know, all that uh, uh, was proved false. I mean, his great, I think his best novel is A Farewell to Arms, uh, which is his, you know, his World War I novel, um, published in 1929, uh, is fabulous, uh, but it's filled with this sense of disillusionment. You know, there's a great uh, uh, paragraph in there where Hemingway's character, uh, Frederick Henry, says, um, you know, we, we'd, we'd seen patriotic slogans on billboards and we'd heard patriotic speeches, but now we knew that um, the, what patriotism led to was the utter destruction and people being churned up into meat like uh, uh, you, you happened in the, on the south side of Chicago, uh, except in this case, you buried the meat. You know, in other words, you've, 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 the, all these young men were just chewed up uh, in the same way that you chew up a cow to create hamburger. Uh, and so, in other words, we knew that these values had, had just led to slaughter, to pointless, utter slaughter. Hemingway is strongly affected by that. He's a very strong isolationist at first in the 1930s, I think, in part of, as a product of that. Yeah. yeah. Well, so it, 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 it's, it's easy to see how Heming, Hemingway's work resonates with a society an American society in the 1920s that's feeling a lot of the a lot of the same things, right? We 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 lost half a million half a million young men, and 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 for what purpose? Uh, could you say a minute before I want to go on and talk about the, the about the the Great Depression and how it sort of falls out of favor in the 1930s? But sure. could you first say a bit about his relationship to uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald? That's a that's a it's a great question. It's kind of a tragic story, because uh, you know Fitzgerald had uh, uh, succeeded uh, very well with his first novel and was kind of a leading literary figure, and so when Hemingway meets him, he's kind of the apprentice, and Hem uh, Fitzgerald's the master, and I think Fitzgerald was a per who, uh, was a person of great generosity, and he's very helpful to Hemingway, and they become great friends. And they shared a uh, love for drinking, <laughs> you know, uh, and they boosted it up a lot together. Um, and then Hemingway kind of comes into his own and, and also becomes a great novel. And Fitzgerald, and by the way, I think Fitzgerald is an absolutely marvelous, m marvelous writer. I, I mean, I think his novels are uh, absolutely, many of them are absolutely pristine, uh, magnificent. Um, so I, I think Fitzgerald is, is, is just as, uh, an important literary figure as Hemingway, but they have, as time goes on and Hemingway's reputation grows and Fitzgerald starts to fade, I think in part because of some, um, you know, Fitzgerald, uh, had some issues, uh, family issues that were, were difficult for him. His wife had some mental health issues that were, uh, traumatic to him. I also think he was drinking heavily. Um, and in, in time in the 1930s, like they basically have a kind of falling out. Hemingway, it just has to be said that Hemingway could be extraordinarily ungenerous, uh, to uh, his people that, uh, helped him early in his career. And Fitzgerald was another one where I think he was rather ungenerous, um, later in life, you know, Fitzgerald in, in 1936 or 1937, or it might be earlier than that, it might have the year wrong, but it's mid 1930s wrote an essay describing his struggles with um, substance abuse and writing called The Crack Up that was published in Esquire or one of the leading dailies. Um, and it's a very, it's a very affecting story. And uh, at that time, it was a remarkable admission, you know, it wasn't considered, 
you know, culturally a good idea for a man to basically say, well, here's here, here are all my weaknesses and here's what here's what I've struggled to deal with the way it is today. I mean, today is um, people are, are fall over each other to talk about their foibles. But in the 1930s, it was on third. Well, Hemingway was uh, savagely critical of Fitzgerald's decision to write uh, to write that story and of uh, 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 that account, I should say, of his personal struggles and, and of the account itself. So their friendship is a, is a classic example, I think, of Hemingway being rather un, unkind to people that helped him early in his career. Hmm. So he, he's uh, uh, Hemingway becomes uh, tremendously popular in the 1920s. But his popularity starts to fade somewhat in the 1930s. What's going on there? It's a great question. And uh, so Hemingway moves to Key West in 1928 with his second wife. He's divorced his first wife, uh, Hadley Richardson, divorced her in 1927 and marries Pauline Pfeiffer, who was uh, a rather um, uh, dashing correspondent for the Paris edition of Vogue and came from a very wealthy family. And um, and they moved to Key West, which uh, um, was kind of an abs at that time was rather like moving to this to the moon. You know, I mean, it was it was this isolated island, uh, you know, or at the end of that um, uh, end of Florida. Um, and he moves there with Pauline and, and they, they buy this magnificent house uh, and start living the life. And I think Hemingway, you know, he's he publishes a feral with arms sold the film rights to Farewell Arms, I think, for $100,000, you know, just the film rights to the novel. And Pauline has her, has money, too. She comes from an immensely wealthy family. So uh, he starts to live the life of uh, someone who is, a, you know, a kind of a, uh, has become an international celebrity, has money, fame, looks, uh, becomes a passionate deep sea fisherman. Uh, and then also goes on safari to Africa. Again, this goes, John, this goes to the Rooseveltian ethos. He he literally hires the guide that took Theodore Roosevelt around. Uh, Philip Percival guided Roosevelt when he went on his safaris in Africa. Hemingway hires it. How old uh, must he have been by this time? Well, you know, he's he's yeah. he's getting up there. You know, I mean, he was a young man when he took Roosevelt around, but, you know, 20 plus years have passed, so he's a, he's got to be in his 50s. But he's still doing it. And he uh, takes Hemingway around. Um, but the point is, to get back to your question, uh, Hemingway writes in a, uh, is writing about um, fishing, big game fishing, which becomes passionate marlin fisherman, hunting in Africa, drinking and living the good life in Key West. And meanwhile, the Depression hits the United States and you have, you know, 25 percent unemployment, people lining up to get a bowl of soup in major cities. And so he publishes things like Death in the Afternoon, an account of uh, a description of bullfighting in 1932, Green Hills of Africa, his account of his safari in 1935. He gets a lot of criticism from uh, literary um, reviewers and their basic criticism, and many of them are on the left, you know, uh, and, and they look at this work and say, gee, why isn't Hemingway writing about the proletarian struggle? <laughs> why isn't he writing about uh, the fact that the country is going through this traumatic economic depression and clearly means the capitalism has failed and we need to embrace some kind of collective new uh, uh, world? Uh, you know, Edmund Wilson, who was kind of the uber critic in this in Hemingway, during Hemingway's career, who admired him immensely and wrote wonderful reviews of his best work and said, you know, this guy is the, the, the best stylist in American literature right now. But even Edmund Wilson is writing at the time, well, we really need to modify the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution because they, they've led to this, you know, this disaster. And we need to, we need to have a kind of more collective, um, you know, alter our founding documents so they're more collective. So Hemingway comes in, in for this kind of uh, abuse. It's the first bad criticism he's gotten in his career. Um, and his response to this is, of course, as you might imagine, with Hemingway is kind of volcanic. You know, it's kind of at first it's a big F you, you know, I'm going to write about whatever I want to write. And I don't, I, I'm not going to write to satisfy literary critics uh, who he compares to angle worms in a bottle, you know, <laughs> like you'd go fishing with. You know, they don't really do anything. They're just kind of, you know, wiggling around in a bottle. Um, but in the end, uh, I think Hemingway responds to this. And I think. Uh, I, I think it's part of response to the criticism, but I also think that Hemingway's ethos was as a writer, I'm going to write about the world as it is. 
Well, the world as it is in the 1930s was, and he couldn't help but see this, because uh, Key West was all messed up too by the economic depression, was uh, 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 in the United States was there was tremendous suffering. So he, he, he sees this, and around 1935, I think you see a kind of change in some of the topics uh, that Hemingway wrote about. Now, it's not a complete change. You know, he still writes Snows of Kilimanjaro's and things like that that don't seem to be necessarily related to the economic depression. But he does publish what could be fairly called a proletarian novel to have and to have not uh, in 1937. Um, he so and he publishes a story. Um, I say story; it's actually an account. You know, as, as you know, there was a terrible hurricane in Key, in the Keys in 1935. I think it may be the worst hurricane that ever hit the continental United yeah. States to this day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it and and there were uh, WPA workers laboring on the rail line that go eventually went all the way to Key West. Uh, you know, working on it and the road that eventually goes all the way to Key West. And the federal government uh, was kind of was tardy getting them out. They actually sent a train uh, to get them out in, the, in before the hurricane hit, and the train was destroyed by the hurricane. All the workers were killed. In other words, they made a valiant effort to, to get them there, but the hurricane arrived and everybody was killed. Well, Hemingway writes, this is so emblematic of the change that's happening in Hemingway. He writes a story for the communist New Masses, which was the uber-communist uh, uh, journal in the United States in the 1930s, published by communists. <laughs> uh, and the story is called, uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's really, I, I call it a story. I don't want to give the uh, sense it's fiction. I mean, it's Hemingway reflecting on, it's basically a commentary. It's, it's titled, Who Killed the Vets? And Hemingway savages the Roosevelt administration for not getting these WPA workers out. And, um, you know, Hemingway was in Key West when the storm hit, and it misses Key West. It hits like Marathon and, you know, these uh, islands just above Key West. That's where it just savages everything. And the, the water level comes up and covers the islands. You know, everybody was there was drowned. You know, there was no way to survive. Um, and Hemingway participates in the kind of recovery efforts afterwards. You know, he takes his boat up and motors up there and helps remove bodies from the islands that have now emerged again um up in the trees and I mean, it's just terrible you know yeah, so I, I, that was so traumatic he actually writes the story describing that and then very uh, being very critical of the roosevelt administration in, in the communist new masses so what i'm suggesting is that you know that i think argues that hemingway is having a profound shift and is developing a more sympathetic perspective to the suffering of the depression before we continue with our conversation I'd like to have one of our faculty members tell you about a special documents-based graduate program for teachers of American history, government, and civics. Hi, this is John Moser, chair of the Master of Arts in American History and Government program at Ashland University. If you are an educator who teaches U.S. history, government, or politics, our program may be just what you've been looking for. Our approach is to emphasize primary sources since we think the best way to study the past is to read the words of those who lived it. We have a distinguished faculty made up of professors from both Ashland University and from colleges and universities across the country. And they're not there to lecture to you. We think it's better to learn through conversation about the documents. Ours is a hybrid program with two different types of seminar. The first are our week-long intensive in-person courses during the summers on the beautiful campus of Ashland University. The second are our live synchronous online seminars offered throughout the year. So if you're a social studies teacher and you're looking to deepen your understanding of America's past and its politics, please check out the Master of Arts in American History and Government program. You can do that by visiting tah.org slash programs. I, I had wondered if the, if the hurricane had something to do with that. I, yes. I was just, my, my, my in-laws, uh, spend their uh, winters in marathon i was just down there fabulous uh, visiting yeah. at christmas time and i became interested in the in the hurricane there, there, there are a bunch of you know signs up about it there we went to a museum where i, I learned a lot and I, I just recently read a book by philip dry called storm of the century which, which oh yeah all this stuff. yeah but um one of the things that's really fascinating is the extent to which the administration with the help of congress covered this stuff up they did not want any embarrassing, uh, any embarrassing information coming out 
with presidential elections coming up in the uh, in the following year. So, but, you know, I, I want a little bit of a digression. I, I do want to get to the question of whether this flirtation with the left is what draws him to the Spanish Civil War. But um, what what was it that brought him to Key West in the first place? This was not, you know, Key West has a certain mystique today. I'm not sure that it did back when when he first went there. It would have been a pretty pretty tiny place. Uh, but what what did he find so appealing about Key West? It's a great question. I think Hemingway uh, wanted to leave Paris, where he'd been for some time, but it was uh, an area associated with his marriage to his first wife, which he had abandoned. And he's married a new wife, and so I think staying in Paris was problematic in the sense that it would be associated with his first marriage. So they want to find a new location to live. And John Dos Passos, another you know great writer from that period, Hemingway uh, became fast friends with in the 1920s, had visited Key West and had spoken of it as this kind of, you know, it's a wonderful place to go for a writer. It's it's uh, there are all these outdoor pursuits. The weather's fabulous um, during the winter. Uh, it's very hot during the summer, but in the winter, it's fabulous. It's a great place for you to go. You'll have this. Uh, you'll be in this tropical paradise. You'll be able to do your work. I mean, he sold them on it. So they when they went there in 1928, they were, you know, wow, this is this is it. This is where we should go. And Pauline's uncle Gus, who was this immensely wealthy um, person, actually purchases that house that is the Hemingway house to this day. If you go to Key West, you know that uh, that's where they lived. It was purchased for them by her uncle, and they move right in and and establish residency. And he lives there until 1940 when he moves to Cuba with wife number three, uh, uh, Martha Gellhorn. So it was Dos Passos who got Hemingway to go there. And once he got there, you know, Hemingway, one of the, one of the, I think one of the most charming things about Hemingway was, you know, remember Hemingway never went to college. You know, Hemingway had a high school education back when a high school education was probably today is similar to a junior college education. Um, and then uh, uh, he, he was going to, uh, flirted with going to the University of Illinois, did not go. But the point is that Hemingway, I think, because of that, uh, or I think this is one of the reasons why this was possible, Hemingway got along with working class people. So when he goes to Key West, he pals up with these kind of uh, fishermen and people that worked in the sponge industry before it went belly up and you know moved elsewhere. And they kind of adopt him and teach him the uh, ins and outs of uh, marlin fishing and deep sea fishing and take them on their boats. Uh, and of course, they booze it up, you know, because uh, Key West, even though the, the um, you know, we're in the age of prohibition, Key West, you get booze from Cuba smuggled in. And so you could always get a drink in Key, in Key West, which was another thing that attracted Hemingway to it. You know, uh, I don't want to move back to the United States to, you know, in prohibition, but in Key West, although it has to be said, you could always get a drink in the United States during prohibition. It wasn't like it ever went away. But you know what I mean? I mean, it was, it was readily available in Key West. So that's how he ends up in 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 the keys and it just has to be said too that typically during the summer when it's beastly hot Hemingway would get in the car and drive all the way across the united states you know from the very tip of florida uh to montana and wyoming and spend this the the summer months up in the mountains where it was much cooler hunting and fishing great life yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh He's 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 now in large part as as a in response to uh, the depression and the hurricane of 1935. Yeah, the absolute worst to this day that is ever recorded is having hit the United States. Um, he's he 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 becomes more proletarian. Uh, and is this is this why he decides to go to Spain to fight in the Civil War? Uh, I think partly, and I have to let, let me just say this. Um, I think that um, I think we have to be careful, and I and I I made the suggestion, so I want to I want to qualify it a little bit. When we say Hemingway becomes more proletarian, I think Hemingway is always is absorbing what is around him. You know, he's like a, you know, Hemingway said one of the things that Hemingway said about his drinking was, well, whenever I had a drink, uh, my mind would shut down. In other words, that's his way of rela re relaxing because. Um, he's when when he's not drinking, he's absorbing everything around him. He had this phenomenal memory, and that was really the basis of his writing. You know, he could recall these scenes and then shape them uh, into fiction. 
So um, I think I think he's absorbing the Great Depression, and that makes him. I think I do think he wrote in a kind of proletarian vein. But it's always important to remember that Hemingway was strongly libertarian. Uh, he thought the government was basically vexing him; was just a big pain in the butt, uh, and vexed him for taxation. You know, during the Franklin Roosevelt years, of course, the tax rate goes up to ninety percent, and the ninety percent on marginal income above one hundred thousand uh, dollars. So Hemingway always bitched that, oh, gee, you know, now I'm finally cleaning, <laughs> finally actually making some real money, and the government parachutes in and takes it. Uh, what the hell, you know, <laughs> it was one of his complaints in his letters. Uh, but I do think he, I think, I do think, I just want to say, I do think he's, um, I think he's always has that libertarian sentiment. I don't think that ever leaves him. It's, it's, it's the kind of the foundational, his foundational view of government, but I think he's absorbing the suffering. And so he ends up writing about it. It does have a kind of proletarian aspect to it. I just want to qualify that. So, so he so he goes off to Spain. Yes. In what 37, 38. It's yes. an enormously complicated situation. Uh the, the you know, the, the the simplified version is well, it's the Republicans versus the nationalists, but we know that the Republicans had everything from anarchists to liberals <laughs> to, to communists, yes. and the nationalists were everything from monarchists to, to fascists. Uh where does he what makes him go for one thing? And where does he fit into this this mess? It's a great question, and I think I think he's drawn to Spain because he had he he felt a real fealty with Spanish culture. You know, he had gone to Pamplona in the 1920s and 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 witnessed the feria and became almost obsessed with bullfighting, uh, and really loved Spain and its people. So when the war starts. Uh, he's very concerned and upset about its effect on the Spanish people. Also, Hemingway from 1934 to 1935 is uh, writing about the menace of fascism. You know, early on, as early as the 1920s, he, he lampoons Mussolini in his Toronto Star pieces as a, as a big phony. And he recognizes early the menace of Hitler. Uh, and he's very concerned about fascism as a kind of worldwide threat. Uh, or uh, to democracy and to generally good government. And, and and so he sees Spain as the theater in which fascism might possibly be stopped. You know, not only he, so he wants to go there to, um, you know, to to be part of the suffering of the Spanish people and write about it, but he also wants to go there to encourage anti-fascism. He's a passionate anti-fascist. Uh, so that's what draws him to Spain. He, he's there on three or four trips He's covering the war for the North American Newspaper Alliance, but he also comes back to the United States in between trips and raises money to support uh, sending supplies. Now, you can only send medical supplies, you know, non-military supplies to Spain because of the neutrality acts. Um, so he that's all he can do. But he does that, you know, he, he he's uh, uh, assists in, you know, sending ambulances and associated medical supplies to the Republic, the Spanish Republic as part of his anti-fascist um, efforts. And he begins to write, uh, you know, his stories from Spain are factual accounts about what's going on in Spain, but he also writes our, uh, a piece, is basically commentary, arguing that the United States should uh, abandon neutrality and give money to the Republicans, uh, you know, the anti-fascists in Spain, to defeat the fascists in Spain, to avoid a larger conflict with Nazi Germany and fascism, a kind of world war. I mean, Hemingway was very, was very prophetic about this. You know, in other words, if we don't defeat the fascists in Spain, we're going to be stuck with a larger and stronger fascist movement a few years down the uh, pike, and it'll be a, a larger conflict, and, and it might draw the United States in. Well, that's exactly what happened. Uh, you know, he, you know, he's writing this as early as 1935, 1937. Um, you know, that kind of general period. Um, you know, trying to awaken people to the menace of fascism. So those are the two things that drew him to Spain, and that is largely um, uh, his argument in his work associated with Spain. Hmm. So uh, he he warns that if if we don't commit to the republic, we're going to be eventually drawn into something much larger. As you say, the, the United States is drawn into that that larger something. Uh, what what's Hemingway up to during World War II? So he um, um, once again becomes a correspondent uh, uh, 
to uh, covering the war, although he doesn't rush to the war. Uh, it's interesting, Hemingway's biographers note that Hemingway spent uh, 1941 and 1942 in Cuba, um, and he uh, uses his boat as a kind of uh, anti-submarine uh, patrol boat. Uh, with some help from the U.S. government, he managed to convince the government to give him gasoline and and arms and even um, non-commissioned uh, enlisted men on his boat, you know, with so they had machine guns and Thompson guns and grenades and all those fun things. <laughs> and he's motoring around Cuba, you know, trying to spot a submarine. He had this uh, kind of uh, ludicrous plan that if they saw a submarine, they would creep up on it and they would hurl grenades and, you know, into the cunning, you know, the hatch in the cunning tower and blow it up, which I think would have just gotten them killed. Um, and probably wouldn't have harmed the s submarine. I mean, I'm sure the sub would have shot him up if it got close enough to throw grenades. Uh, but so he does that, until, and then eventually Martha Gellhorn goes off, his fourth, uh, third wife goes off to the war to cover it, and then Hemingway follows her in 1944. So he spends 1944 in uh, England and then in Europe attached to an infantry division, becomes great friends with, his, with the infantry regiment's commander, a colonel named Buck Lanham, and um, follows them, uh, you know, the, them around uh, as they move into uh, Germany and, and sees, you know, once again, the worst of uh, all the horrible things that, you know, that he'd seen in World War I and the Spanish Civil War, too. I mean, Hemingway saw everything that war comes with war, you know, the terrible casualties, the civilian deaths, the atrocities. Um, uh, he probably fought in World War II. Um, uh, there, you know, um, there are veiled suggestions that Hemingway, uh, you know, because he did, he carried sidearms and a carbine, which, by the way, war correspondents weren't supposed to do. You know, in other words, he had arms. Um, uh, and Hemingway was actually, during the war, was actually brought up on charges uh, by the army for, uh, for uh, you know, f using arms as a non-combatant, which was illegal. And the army eventually acquitted him, I think, in part because Hemingway perjured himself in the in the hearing and said, no, I, you know, I didn't do that. And because he was Hemingway, they kind of let it go. You know, I don't think they wanted really to make a martyr out of him. But the point is that Hemingway participates in the war as a correspondent, participates probably at times as a combatant. Um, and out of it comes another novel across the river uh, and into the trees uh, and some short fiction. Uh, Black Ass at the Crossroads is his World War II story. It's uh, it's very good. It's very it's very upsetting, but it's it's very good. Hmm. You know, there was a book some time ago that that came out with a suggestion that um, Hemingway may have briefly spied for the Soviet Union. You think there's any truth to that? You know, this is this is an interesting question. Uh, there's been some suggestions that uh, Hemingway uh, had a Soviet contact, um, and uh, you know, I haven't looked into this in any detail. I don't think that I think that Hemingway. If you look at for for whom the bell tolls, which is Hemingway's Spanish Civil War novel published in 1940, Robert Jordan, the hero of that novel, later played by uh, Cooper in um, the the film with Ingrid Ingrid uh, Bergman. Uh, Robert Jordan in the in the novel, and he's of course Hemingway's voice says, "Well, you know, I I I, and I'm paraphrasing here. I see all the atrocities that the Soviet Union is committing in Spain, or their you know their secret police, you know, because they were murdering uh, anti-Stalin uh, people on the Republican side during the war while the war is going on. I mean, in other words, they were purging the Republican side of people who were opposed to Stalinism." while the war was being fought. And so Robert Jordan says, you know, I think the Soviet Union is essential to the success of the Republic because they're providing arms and men and material and uh, support we can't get from the democracies because of their neutrality acts. But by the way, they're, you know, they're ruthless totalitarianism, totalitarians, you know, they're killing uh, dissent. I mean, George Orwell had to flee for his life, you know, because George Orwell was not a Stalinist. He was on the left, but he wasn't uh, in favor of Stalin. Uh, so the upshot is, um, I think that Hemingway probably had, um, you know, Hemingway liked to dabble in these things. So he probably probably talked to Soviet intelligence officers or Soviet army officers 
and he they may have plumbed him for information but what did Hemingway know I mean it's not like you know he had conversations with Eisenhower or you know somebody uh well this is uh you know here's the uh here's the plans for the atomic bomb I mean he, you know, he doesn't know anything like that so um I think so, it's sometimes presented I think to sell books or to to make a splash Ooh, you know Hemingway was this Soviet agent well Hemingway was an international celebrity. Of course, he, you know, people are going to want to talk to him. And of course, they may be associated with intelligence work or, you know, the Soviet military or something like that. But Hemingway wouldn't have any, any, any great insight that they'd be interested in. You know, they might have been interested in cultivating him just because he was Hemingway. But is it, is it really that significant? No, nah, I don't think so. What, uh, what about his post-war career? Yeah, I, you know, Hemingway, uh, after, you know, he marries his wife, number four, in 1946, uh, Martha Gohorn, uh, he met, meets in Sloppy Joe's in 1936, his third wife. But she was very independent, was a, was a great writer in her own right, and uh, was not content to just simply be kind of uh, a home person uh, as a wife. And so they divorced during the war, and he marries World War II. He marries Mary Welsh in 1946 and uh, continues to live in Cuba. He'd bought a house there with Martha Gohorn in 1940 and moves to Cuba because Key West is associated with wife number two, Pauline Pfeiffer. His post war career is kind of up and down. You know, he produced his World War II novel, Across the Rivers and Into the Trees, is published in 1950. It's, it's I think, Hemingway's worst novel. It's not very good. It's almost a parody of his style. Um, it was savaged by the critics. Uh, and I think he was devastated by the reaction to it, but he was very resilient. He comes back and writes The Old Man in the Sea, which is a wonderful kind of long short story that's published as a novella. It's in uh, the glossy magazines and it sweeps the country and he ends up winning the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1954, which he was very pleased to get. Um, you know, it was kind of the pinnacle of his career. Um, and I think that the old man in the sea is a very fine piece of work. You know, he, he, he comes back, you know, he's like the punch drunk fighter who you think is out and is reeling against the can, you know, against the, against at the ropes on the ring and then comes back and knocks out the, you know, his opponent, boom, and goes down. Um, so he, he gets there in 1954. Unfortunately, uh, he goes back to Africa, and uh, uh, he's terribly injured in two plane crashes in Africa, where he was flying in a light plane. Uh, one of them, one of the, in one of the instances, the light plane runs into some uh, electric wires or something, and then is damaged and manages to land, but kind of crash landing. He's terribly injured, and then the very next day, another light plane arrives to take him off, oh, oh, you know, take him away after the first plane crash and that plane as it's taking off crashes <laughs> and the Hemingway is seriously injured in that. Uh, so he has these terrible injuries from two successive plane crashes is drinking, you know, he's, he was always um, uh, a rather aggressive drinker, a uh, heavy drinker. He did try to taper off near the end of the 1950s was drinking less and trying to take care of himself, um, had high blood pressure and all the maladies that come with old age. And also, you know, a, a very active uh, life. You know, Hemingway had a magnificent physique. And the good thing about that was it, it enabled him to do all these wonderful outdoor things and to be very productive as a writer. The bad thing was he abused it. You know, it, it, you know, he could drink all night and then get up the next day and not really be, you know, he'd be hung over, but he'd be fine after a short period of time. He was just a very strong physique. Well, all that catches up to him at the end of the 1950s. And he begins to suffer depression. I think, you know, Hemingway's oldest son, John, uh, I think diagnosed it very well. John said um, he couldn't cope with being an old man. You know, he had lived this, you know, fabulous, I mean, a life that is almost a model of how to get the most out of your existence on earth. You know, I mean, what had he done? He'd done everything. Uh, and, and with the ultimate of gusto. But by the time, by the time of 1959, 1960, he's he's an old man and he can't do the things that you, you can't do at 60 what you could do at 28. And some people can cope with that and some people can. And John said, basically, he would have been a great old man if he could have adjusted to being an old man. So I think he becomes depressed in part because of that and um, and starts to drift into kind of suicidal thoughts. 
And as you know, he's treated at the Mayo Clinic for uh, depression and um, threats of suicide, and the Mayo Clinic gives him electroshock treatments, uh, and and the, it has the precise opposite effect it was intended. It makes him more suicidal, and he, um, when he goes home, he uh, from from a second bout of electroshock treatments, he uh, he kills himself by shooting himself in the head. It's a rather tragic end. Um, I think uh, one of the things that Hemingway said before he committed suicide was, you know, because of these electroshock treatments, I've lost my memory. And that was the wellspring. And Hemingway just says it. That's the wellspring of my creativity. That's what I draw on to do my fiction. What am I going to do now? So the electroshock treatment, now maybe his memory would have come back, but, I, you know, I think in his state of depression, that kind of solidified his desire to end his life you know i mean there's no sense going on i you know everything that i've done you know my my raison d'etre my reason for existence is has ceased and i think uh, let me say one more thing and I'll, uh, uh, and that is i think the tragedy is right before hemingway's death he's completed the manuscript of a move of a feast which his wife his fourth wife published in 1964 after it's a fabulous book it's a memoir of his time in paris uh, it's a marvelous, it's marvelously written. In other words, he was at, he had re, kind of recaptured, you know, once again, he's up off the canvas and he's kind of recaptured his, all of his gifts as a writer. And he's writing this in 1960 and 1959. Uh, and it's magnificent. So mm -hmm. it's just, uh, and, and, and it's just tragic that he ends up li uh, ending his life when once again he had proved his ability to provide interesting, um, uh, very interesting works of uh, of literature. So what a tragedy. Too bad he couldn't have gone on and, and lived a more normal lifespan. Did he offer any political commentary during his later life? You know, he was, he, he I, I, not, not really. I mean, he drifts, you know, again, he's, uh, he's an observer of the world. And he dabbles a little bit in 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 um, in some of that, but it's it's nothing that I would call particularly significant. I mean, he writes uh, or a kind of short statement on uh, JFK's inaugural, which he struggled to do because of his uh, you know issues with depression and with the tr treatments that he was getting, uh, which depressed him further. You know, he had a hard time writing it. Uh, took days where it should have, you know, we're talking about like a couple sentences and it should have taken, you know, an hour, if, if that, uh, the old Hemingway, the healthy Hemingway. Um, so in other words, he, 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 I think he and his wife approved of the, of uh, JFK. I know his fourth wife, Mary, was enamored of John F. Kennedy to the point of leaving Hemingway's papers to the JFK library where they exist to this day. Mm -hmm. Um but beyond that, uh, nothing, you know, particularly um, worth recalling. Well, we're running out of time. There's one, there's one more question that I'm dying to ask you. When, when we lost Hemingway, uh, was that was, was he just one of a kind, or is there anybody who's who's written since that you would say is 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 in that in that general category? Maybe if not quite at his level. That's a great question. And, um, you know, I would, I, th you know, when I think of great fiction writers, I often look or am attracted to people who emulate Hemingway style. Uh, so in the 1990s, I thought Raymond Carver wrote some fabulous short stories that were very evocative of Hemingway's kind of spare theory of omission style and could, um, could evoke from me the same kind of reaction that I have to some of Hemingway's best short fiction. I mean, I think Hemingway's best work was his short fiction in the 1920s, which isn't to dismiss his later stuff. It's great. But the short fiction, I mean, the short fiction from the 1920s, Big Two-Hearted River, Soldier's Home, The Battler. I mean, go down the list. Everyone is a gem. A hundred years from now, they'll still be read. Uh, and you know, you know that that's really the test of you know is a is a is someone a great writer? Well, the the, the test is will they be read a hundred years from now? Uh, that stuff will always be read. Raymond Carver, I thought, was very you know was uh, very evocative of um, of Hemingway. I I thought his stuff was uh, very good. I I like Charles Williford's novels. In the 1980s, Charles Williford was publishing some great. Uh, Hoke Mosley stories. Um, one of them was made into a film with Alec Baldwin. 
uh, I think, what is it called? Miami Blues or something like that. Uh, it's a wonderful film. It's right out of, it's a, it's very, um, uh, very much representative of, of, of uh, Charles Williford's novels. I, I think his work is also very Hemingway-esque. I like his stuff. Um, but I, it just has to be said, I am not a great aficionado of contemporary fiction. <laughs> so I might, not, I might not be the best uh, guide uh, on this. Uh, uh, there may be others that could answer that in a better way than I have. Yeah. Well, this has just been delightful, Dan. I, I really uh, appreciate your joining us and, and sharing your insights on Hemingway. Not only one of the, 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 the true uh, great, uh, great, uh, great authors in all of literature, but, but someone it seems to me was quintessentially American and uh, quintessentially an American of his era. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's just such a pleasure to, to be here with you, John, my dear friend, uh, and to talk about Hemingway. So I'm very grateful and appreciative. All right. Well, and I want to thank everyone for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed this, uh, this conversation as much as I did. Thank you for listening to this episode of The American Idea. If you enjoyed this episode, Remember to subscribe at Apple Podcast, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and leave a five-star review. If you want to learn more or get involved in Ashbrook's vital work, visit our website, ashbrook.org.